When the New York Times launched its 1619 project last year, it sought to reframe the country's history by placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of our national narrative. What began as a series of articles and commentaries in the Times Magazine and morphed into a collection of lesson plans for elementary and high school students provoked an immediate controversy. Five of the nation's most eminent academic historians co-signed a letter to the Times describing the project as partly misleading and containing factual errors. And Northwestern University professor Leslie M. Harris revealed that she had been a fact checker on the series and that her warnings of a major error of interpretation had been ignored. But Harris also took detractors of the 1619 Project to task for misrepresenting both the historical record and the historical profession, writing that the attacks from its critics are much more dangerous than the Times' avoidable mistakes. Enter Philip W. Magnus, an economic historian, a research fellow at the American Institute for Economic Research, and the author of a new series of essays on the 1619 Project. Though Magnus has praised aspects of the series, he says that the project's editor, Nicole Hannah-Jones, is guilty of blurring lines between serious scholarship and partisan advocacy. And he's called for the retraction of an essay in the series by Princeton sociologist Matthew Desmond, which was headlined, If you want to understand the brutality of American capitalism, you have to start on the plantation. I spoke with Magnus from his office in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, about what the Times gets right and wrong about U.S. history, capitalism and slavery, Abraham Lincoln's legacy, and why our interpretation of American history matters in contemporary society. Phil Magnus, thanks for talking to Reese. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's uh, you know start at the, the the project. It's it's a collection of essays that you've been writing since the 1619 project came out. Um, you can get it at IIER's website. Um, what is the what's the basic nub of your critique of the 1619 project? Well, I'd say the uh, the impetus for doing this project was really taking a look at the reaction that uh, was coming out of the 1619 Project when it was published back in August of 2019. And here's a very uh, worthwhile topic that uh, the New York Times uh, set out to investigate with uh, right. looking at the history of slavery and contextualizing that in American life all the way from uh, – they go basically back to Jamestown, Virginia right. and trace it all the way up to today – which I think is a very worthwhile story that needs to be told. And quite a bit of the content of the project uh, did that admirably. But uh, what immediately concerned me about it was uh, the heavy ideological flavor that was inserted into several of the essays, and particularly the historical pieces and their discussion of slavery. And that ideological flavor was, uh, was almost uh, over-the-top anti-capitalism. Yeah, now, a, so uh, you, you uh, point to the uh, Matthew Desmond essay in particular, and that's kind of the, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's the only thing, but it's it's a main part of, of you know, what, what you find problematic about the series. Um, he is, uh, can you explain a little bit about what what is his basic argument and what does it get wrong about the role of capitalism and slavery? Yeah, so Desmond's argument is basically an origin story. He's trying to claim that the origin of American capitalism and with that the Industrial Revolution, everything that we've seen in terms of American economic growth from about the 19th century to the present is derivative of and directly connected to the legacy of slavery. Right. Uh, another and way to and the, most famously, he talks about how, uh, you know, double book double entry bookkeeping, right. accounting on the plantation gives rise almost to, I mean, literally to Microsoft, Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, that it's all this continuous uh, privation that is uh, that is capitalist in nature. And it started on a slave plantation yeah. and it's in, you know, office suites right now. Yeah, basically an origin story. And that's almost a direct quote from the essay. He mm -hmm. says that we can trace from the plantation books in the early 19th century to Microsoft Excel today. Right. And, uh, you know, among other errors, I mean, he seems to believe that double entry accounting started right. in the antebellum South. What what are its origins and, what, and why does that kind of detail matter in this? this yeah, so, large point? so historians of accounting, I know that's a very dry subject area, but that actually goes back to uh, late medieval Italy, uh, the Italian mm -hmm. city states that were uh, some of the early banking hubs of, uh, of the European uh, market exchange. 
started to develop these techniques as a um, as a way to do their business. And this is something that evolved over centuries of time, long before the slave trade uh, uh, ignites in the Western Hemisphere, long before the plantations are adapting some of these techniques. But one of the points that I um, I keep making uh, as a, um, a criticism of the 1619 Project, they're telling this origin story that links it to the plantations. But you can go to almost any society from uh, about the late Renaissance to uh, uh, the, the modern age, and you find double-entry accounting taking place. Uh, even the Soviet Union is, right. uh, is using double-entry accounting, and we aren't claiming that uh, modern industrialization came out of the Soviet Union. So why the uh, plantations? You know, I, I have to admit that I uh, a couple of years ago, I interviewed interviewed one of the members of Pussy Riot, and she was telling me, I was like, you know, what was your experience of, of you know, communism? And she was like, we didn't have communism, we had state capitalism. <laughs> uh, and she was saying, you know, that uh, she was uh, 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 yeah, a supporter of Bernie Sanders. So sure, she sure. was talking about how, like, you know, what they had in the Soviet Union wasn't communism. So uh, maybe there's some uh, point to be said about that. Um, you talk about the new history of capitalism right. as, is the historical movement that Desmond and and much of the part of the 1619 project, or at least the part that deals with the with, um, you know, from Jamestown and the introduction of chattel slavery of, of you know, of blacks in through the Civil War. Um, it rests upon this new interpretation, this new historical school. What is the, the new histor uh, history of capitalism and why is that important? Yeah, so the new history of capitalism was a, a movement that emerged out of the U.S. history profession, mostly in the wake of the financial crisis. So you start seeing its early origins around 2008, 2009. And what these are are a, a group of historians, mostly centered around elite Ivy League schools mm -hmm. that have um, attempted to rewrite the history of, of the American economy and capitalism in general. Uh, from a perspective that uh, that really draws upon a um, a critical approach to the institution of capitalism, right. uh, they play a lot of word games in the way that they even define the institution. You have um, uh, records of interviews and articles that some of the historians associated with this have made, where you ask them to define capitalism, and they say, "Well, we can't really define it." But then in practice, it becomes capitalism is a stand-in for anything and everything they dislike about mm -hmm. the economy. So, and, and you know, one of one of the main claims of the NHC school or the New History of Capitalist School, Capitalism School, is that slavery was absolutely the major economic activity, or or rather, that the productivity of slavery accounted for fifty percent or even eighty percent of GDP in the in the pre Civil War uh, uh, United States. Why is that wrong, or how do, how do we know that that's wrong? And yeah. what what you know, and none of none of this is to diminish at all, obviously, the suffering and misery and and just the wrongness of slavery. But you know what what's going on here? You know, I've referred to the new history of capitalism as the new King Cotton School of history, mm -hmm. um, and that they're in a way kind of reviving an old argument that was popular at the on the eve of the Civil War, and that was that cotton made the world's economy turn. Uh, cotton is so centric that, that if you uh, disrupt plantation slavery, you disrupt this uh, productive process, the world economy will grind to a halt. And we know the Confederacy uh, kind of built its foreign policy around this argument. It ends up being proven false by the war itself. Why but they is actually it proven it. wrong? Uh, well, yeah, the, 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 the central claim of it was that cotton was so uh, essential to trade, to finance, to manufacturing, to uh, cross-Atlantic transfer of goods, imports and exports, that anything and everything that you did uh, in those industries would be disrupted if the, the southern cotton supply was cut off. Mm -hmm. And you get from this, so some of the new history of capitalism authors, in particular, there's one, uh, a book by a uh, Cornell historian named Ed Baptist called The Half Has Never Been Told. And he does this weird back of the envelope uh, attempt to account for how much cotton production made up of GDP in the United States before the Civil War. And he comes through uh, these, these steps of, um, of calculations and basically concludes that cotton made up half of the U.S. economy. Well, the problem is he defied all standard practices of how you do national income accounts. When he came up with this, so he, he, he double and triple counts 
all the different stages of other types of production. Uh, so a more realistic um, economic historian's approach to calculating cotton share of the U.S. economy would probably put it at between 5 and 7 percent as opposed to 50 percent. Uh, so th- th- these are guys that are basically reinventing their own proprietary form of um, economic methodology that's completely at odds with the field itself, coming up with this ostentatious claim that just so happens to align with this um, ideological depiction of cotton as the centerpiece of the world economy before the Civil War. You know, one of the uh, one of the kind of uh, main lines of argument in the book is that historians are not very good economists. Right. Um, and, and also, and I want to get to the flip side of that, which is that oftentimes economists are not particularly good historians in a second. Very much but so. What, what is going on? I mean, it seems strange in a world uh, if any of us who have gone through uh, graduate school in the past 30 or 40 years knows that the you know the main focus or, or at least rhetoric and lip service is always paid to the idea of interdisciplinarity um, yeah. economics has become one of the if not the dominant social science one of the dominant uh, ways of gathering knowledge um, how are how are historians missing um, you know uh, what what's going on what's the disconnect there well, that's the oddity of it, uh, because prior to about 2010, when this literature burst onto the scene, it was actually fairly common for historians and economists to engage each other in the debate over slavery. Economists came, came at it with a very uh, empirical, data-driven approach. This dates back to the late 1950s when uh, uh, econometrics, or they call it cleometrics, applied right. to history, jumped into the debate. And they, they start to attempt uh, measurements of uh, like how profitable was a plantation. Mm -hmm. how efficient was plantation production, and they're bringing accounting books to do this. So this uh, form of the literature developed from the late 1950s up until the present date. It's probably one of the dominant themes of economic history. It's something that anyone that studies that field uh, goes through very intense debates over. Uh, Yet at the same time, there are historians that focus more on narratives and archival evidence and, um, you know, personal accounts of what slavery was actually like have uh, delved into the same literature. Uh, they, they, they do engage each other, and from about the 1970s to uh, the late 2000s, this was a major recurring theme of historians versus economists. Sometimes they're on the same side. Sometimes they're at heads right. with each other, but they're very engaged in the literature. Then this new history of capitalism comes along, and one of the distinctive features is it has almost no attention paid in it to anything that existed prior to it. No, Even it, though it uses uh, cleometrics or, or it, it supposedly looks at, you know, accounts payable and accounts receivable yeah. and things like that in the it's plantation a, to generate its conclusions. Yeah, I, I see more so it cherry picks from cleometrics. Yeah. It finds uh, bits and pieces of data that seem to fit this uh, pre-existing story that holds up uh, cotton production as the centerpiece of the world economy. Right. And, you know, obviously lurking, uh, that's not even lurking. I mean, it's, it's, it's openly discussed. But a book like Time on the Cross, which came out in the mid-70s and was kind of the high water mark of – uh, I mean, it, it helped change the historiography of the South and the slave experience. But at the same time, that book, uh, which was written by Stanley Angerman and Robert Fogel, who ended up winning a Nobel uh, Prize in economics, it was partly done as a demonstration project to show how history could use economic analysis and economic data to kind of understand things better. Can you talk a little bit about the argument that was going on in Time on the Cross and how that kind of just gets ignored in your reading by the new uh, history of capitalism historians? Yeah, so Time on the Cross comes out uh, in the early 1970s, and it's a culmination of a little more than a decade worth of this cleometric work coming together. Uh, We really uh, started about 1958. There were two uh, economists at Harvard – Alfred Conrad and uh, and John R. Meyer that publish a famous article in the journal of political economy that says, let's try and measure the efficiency of the plantation. Mm -hmm. And this really challenged an older notion of uh, plantation economics that thought of, um, of the old South as being kind of this inefficient relic of an earlier feudal stage of economic development that uh, was bound by its inefficiency to eventually dissipate. And what these uh, cleometricians do and what Angerman and Fogel is they uh, they build the evidence together. They, they actually show that uh, slave plantation systems were able to produce 
economically profitable outputs uh, that would have sustained the institution much longer uh, than we actually realized because of the Civil War's disruption. Right, other- and and they were widely attacked or critiqued at the time yeah. for yeah. Or, you know I. Their economic analysis was taken as some kind of justification for slavery or that slavery was a, a legitimate system. Uh, that isn't what they were saying, right? I right, mean, what they were right. trying to show is that absent some kind of massive disruption, whether it was legal or cultural or, or martial, um, slavery was not going to disappear under its own inefficiency. Yeah, and you find that in especially Fogel's subsequent work. Now, when they publish Time on the Cross, it, it is written in a in sometimes very bombastic style. Mm-hmm. And in some of the cases that were critiqued, they overstated their evidence, even though they're actually trying to bring new evidence to bear. So it's not a perfect work by any means. But what you find in their later work is a very clear acknowledgement that, yes, this is a horrific institution. Uh, it's, a, it's horrific economically and um, in its physical presence, its moral presence. Uh, but nonetheless, we have to see how it actually operates to understand the wickedness of it. Uh, so that that's very clear in that literature. And I think some of the uh, the more uh, tempered historians that engaged it realized that and realized that even if they diverged in their own interpretations, this is a conversation worth having. But that's now, all flown out the window now. Part of part of it, though, and I guess this shows up again in the uh, the new history of capitalism crowd is that various historians started to say, well, you know, some slaves, or at least some slaves, kind of envision themselves almost as wage laborers in a competitive, yeah. in, a, in a free labor economy, you know, and there were stories where slaves would hold out for higher wages or better work situations and things like that. Um, you know, does that, is that part of what informs the anti-capitalist bias that we're seeing, you know, post, you know, in, in the past 10 years of history? I think there is an element to that uh, behind the anti-capitalist bias, although we know from Frederick Hayek, he was writing in the early 1950s, he points out that uh, there is a a pervasive anti-capitalist bias in the history profession that existed back then. Uh, this is before Time on the Cross. This is before Cleometrics. So in some ways, I'd argue that it's even a, it's a residual that's carried over just taking on a new form. What is the um, you know, what what is the main reason for that? Why why would historians, uh, you know, be anti-capitalists, especially, you know, I mean, because there you know, there's people and uh, we both know Deirdre McCloskey, for instance, right. an economic historian who you know, makes a persuasive case and has her life's work has basically been to show that the rise of industri- the industrial revolution and the liberating effects of capitalism, you know, helped free people not just from drudgery and, and disease and whatnot, but to be able to express themselves and live in, in, a, in a varied world. Like, why is that kind of the bizarre outlier position as opposed to the dominant one in the history profession? Yeah. My, my own take on this is a combination of being detached and separated from economic methodology. Mm-hmm. These are scholars that really do not have the, even a basic functional understanding of what capitalism is or does uh, and are certainly not uh, informing themselves. We see that in the, in the example I give with Ed Baptist and uh, basically reinventing GDP stats. Right. Uh, that's not an ideological question. That's a methodological question, and he's just out to lunch. He doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, so there's that element, but I think it also combines with just a general left of center political disposition that's uh, uh, existed in the discipline for a long time of history, but has also gotten much more pronounced in recent years. Uh, of uh, you know, historians do lean, lean politically to the left, so you combine that element of ignorance with an existing political bias. Uh, you start to come uh, at historical topics in a way that confirm that that, that existing bias. You start to look at um, instances of slavery. So, wait a minute, that's capitalistic. Therefore, slavery was capitalism. Right. Therefore, all my biases against slavery t- or against capitalism today are confirmed in slavery. And it's almost you can argue. I, I you point out in the book that many of the uh, many of the contemporary historians will talk about income inequality. They'll talk right. about the Occupy movement or something related to the financial crisis or or moments that are taking place right now, and they kind of work backward to yeah. say this all started with slavery. Um, one of the ironies, uh, you pointed out that, you know, in many ways, these guys are replicating the King Cotton thesis, yeah. which was actually a function of the left. It was people defending right. the Confederacy, defending slavery. Um, one of the other, uh, you know, kind of uh, strange ironies is that um, the, uh, you know, 
it was uh, slave owners hated capitalism or, or rather slavery apologists. Could you talk a little bit about that and why that isn't, you know, coming up more, more as it should? Yeah. So on the eve of the Civil War, probably the single most prominent defender of slavery in America was this fellow by the name of George Fitzhugh. And he wrote uh, two books, uh, Sociology for the South and Cannibals All in the 1850s. He's a prominent writer in DeVal's Review, which is the leading Southern magazine at the time. Uh, but the recurring theme in Fitzhugh's argument is that what we would call laissez-faire theory or capitalism today uh, was a, an existential threat to the plantation slave system. One of the reasons he says this is he's looking overseas to the British abolition movement and seeing who's involved in this. Uh, so uh, if you go back to the, the 1830s and 1840s, the leading figures of the British abolition movement are also very closely connected to the free trade movement. It's Richard Cobden and John Bright, uh, uh, the guys that are responsible for the, the, the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, are, um, are also outspoken abolitionists. So he sees that there's a, a historical unity between what we would call free market or classical liberal capitalist thought at that time and anti-slavery thought. And he thinks that markets are being brought to bear to outcompete and uh, and make slavery obsolete is, ba is basically his argument. He thinks that uh, that capitalism or laissez-faire theory, he even goes so far as to say, is at war with the slave plantation system. Why? Because it's disrupting the social order. He even comes up with uh, what we would call like a proto-Marxist argument that says that slavery is superior to uh, competitive free labor because competitive free laborers are exploited and denied of their surplus value of their labor by the evil capitalists. So so uh, this is writing about a decade before Marx does. He essentially comes at it from a pro-slavery angle, but comes to the same conclusion. So uh, we see this throughout Fitzhugh's work, a very pronounced, explicit anti-capitalist position, but it's also a pro-slavery position. Right. And and that also uh, fits in well with a kind of cultural reading of, of the antebellum South. And actually, even the post-Civil uh, War South or the, the white supremacist yeah. dimension of the South, uh, these were not people who liked cosmopolitanism. They right. didn't like cities. They didn't like capitalism. They didn't like trade. I mean, they didn't like a lot of things that are identified with capitalism because it was disruptive to a kind of hierarchical, um, yeah. static society. Yeah, and the, the King Cotton theory of economics is premised on the notion of essentially like a replicated feudal estate where you have the elite on top, you have the, the lords of the estate, which are the plantation owners, and then James Henry Hammond, who's the guy that coins King Cotton theory uh, in a, a famous speech before the U.S. Senate. Uh, he announces that the, the proper economic social order is built upon what he calls the mud sill. And the mud sill is the bottom rung of society, the laboring class that allows the elite uh, intellectual leaders, which he saw himself as, to live the good life and to develop culture and to uh, uh, develop um, uh, in intellectual pursuits separate and apart from the, the menial tasks of labor. But his premise of this economic system is you need someone to do the menial tasks and the slaves are there to do that. So it's a, it's a very structured, hierarchical way of looking at the economy uh, that diverges sharply from everything we know about free labor and competition and people choosing their own uh, course in life, people exercising their own agency and deciding where to work. Uh, it's uh, he wants a top down directive being offered by the uh, uh, almost paternalistic lord of the estate, the plantation owner that tells the working class where their rung is in society and what they have to do. Right. And and you can see that in kind of proto socialists like Thomas Carlyle. Absolutely. Or in in certain kind of backward looking Marxist theorists who who look back at the Middle Ages, for instance, and love it because even though. Uh, you know, not everything is, you know, not everybody is equal or anything like that. Everybody has a place and an order and the respected as somehow being integral to a yeah. society as yeah. opposed to a capitalist society where, you know, the machine just kind of like, you know, the wheels spin off and all kinds of weird stuff happens. Yeah. And you have someone like Thomas Carlyle. So Fitzhugh is a student of Thomas Carlyle, a great admirer. He takes the title of one of his book, Cannibals All, from Carlyle's diagnosis of the Irish lower class during the famines. 
And he says that this is similar to the slave situation. Uh, they're like the Irish peasants, basically. Uh, so uh, you have a, a disciple of Carlyle that's carrying forth his anti-market bias, and we see this t- taking place in a dialogue across the Atlantic. So Carlyle's famous. He, he coins the term economics is the dismal science because economics wants to free the slaves, wants to emancipate the colonies. Well, uh, you see someone like Titchew picks that up and runs with it and says, yes, this is also true in the United States. The dismal science, uh, the science of Adam Smith and Richard Cobden and John Bright and David Ricardo wants to liberate the slaves of the South. So uh, in one of the, the, the most glaring passages in his book, he says, I want to displace this political economy of freedom. I want to toss Adam Smith and uh, Jean-Baptiste Say and all of these great liberal economists into the fire and replace it with this uh, paternalistic kind of feudal approach to an organized society and its economy. Um, you know, if one of the major misunderstandings then of, and, and uh, you know, and, the, and part of your critique of the 1619 Project is that it misunderstands the economics of slavery and, and the larger kind of set of uh, issues and, and realities that come out of that. Another big part of it has to do with the uh, work by the editor of the project, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Um, could you talk a little bit about what her primary mistake is as as you see it in that right. work um what what was that Right. So Nicole Hannah Jones wrote uh, what could be considered kind of like a synthesis essay of summarizing all the purposes of the project. But she also takes on the main treatment of the American Revolution and covers basically the period from about 1775 through the Civil War. There's a big focus in her essay. And one of the claims she makes, and this is the one that got her into trouble with all these prominent historians, Mm -hmm. she claims that the American Revolution was uh, principally fought to protect slavery against the British. And this comes about from uh, what I would argue is a very poor misreading of bits and pieces of the evidence um, of what's going on in the anti-slavery scene on the eve of the American Revolution. Uh, There are two events that happen. One is uh, in Great Britain proper, there's a famous uh, legal case that frees a slave that's brought over from the colonies into England. Uh, Basically, he petitions for a writ of habeas corpus, and the judge grants it to him on the grounds that he was being held against his will in in England um, when there's no law in the book that establishes slavery to hold them there. Uh, so this is a major victory in the sense that it triggers the British abolition movement. This is 1772. So she says, well, wait a minute. Abolition's emerging in, in Great Britain. That's true. Uh, but she also mistakes that for uh, a motive in the colonists. Uh, when, when they revolt, uh, you know, four years later, start to resist the crown. Uh, she makes this argument that uh, the 1772 decision in the British courts was now seen as an existential threat being uh, carried over to the American colonies, which is not true at all. So, so it's kind of like if America doesn't break free of England uh, or of, of Britain, Britain is going to outlaw slavery. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, and uh, obvious. What you know? Why is that obviously wrong? Well, uh, the, the, the first and clearest point of evidence is Britain does not outlaw slavery in its own remaining colonies for another 50 years after the American Revolution. It's not until 1830 uh, that, um, that Britain really starts to seriously consider emancipation in, uh, in its Caribbean holdings, all of its other colonies around the world. And that comes about after a 50-year legislative slog. Uh, we have the first evidence. It's in, uh, I believe it's 1789 is the first attempt uh, to have a serious discussion about just outlawing the British slave trade uh, in Great Britain proper. It takes an almost 20 year battle before that bill even passes Parliament. So uh, there, there, there's very little evidence that Britain was on the precipice of, um, of abolishing slavery in the colonies and quite a bit of evidence to the contrary. Uh, now the the Times has made a minor, uh, right. you know, kind of concession on this. How did they change the language that they used to talk about that point? Um, and you know, what does that say about their, um, uh, in your mind, their commitment to to the truth? Yeah, yeah. So the original version basically stressed the preeminence of slavery as a cause. 
of uh, precipitating the American Revolution. And they backed down. It was just a very, very minor editing of the text that basically changed it from a, a preeminent cause to a cause considered by some members of American society. And that's a, there, there's a, uh, it's a more tepid claim, but there's a little bit more evidence that you can say behind that because right. there are instances of resistance among uh, the patriots, among the American colonists, when various British officials try to offer freedom to slaves in, in exchange for fighting in the loyalist armies. Right. Uh, Although so, it's also telling in, in those cases, it's always, um, it, you know, if you're fighting for the loyalists and you're being held by American patriots, right. we'll free you. But if you're owned by loyalists, forget it. Right, right. So this yeah. is a caveat. It's put in the famous yeah. proclamation. It's called Lord Dunmore's Proclamation. It comes out in late 1775. He's the governor of Virginia, and he's basically on the run from the uh, uh, the emerging rebels at the time. So as his last ditch effort to hold on to his rule, as he says, um, "I will free any slave that belongs to someone in rebellion that comes over and joins my army." Oh, by the way, any loyalist slave owner is exempt from this. Right. So um, now, you know, you do say, um, you know, I mean, you're not you're not just panning the 1619 project and you say, you know, it has a lot of good stuff in it. I want to get to that larger question sure. in a second. But uh, just focusing on Nicole Hannah Jones a little bit more, um, you do say that her reading of Lincoln is right. an important one and that it brings nuance that oftentimes gets dismissed in kind of discussions of Lincoln. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is one area that I've credited the project of being more right than wrong or more right than the critics. So what Nicole Hannah Jones does is she she attempts to contextualize the American Civil War from the African American perspective. Uh, which does chafe with kind of the more standard history that views Lincoln as the great emancipator who comes in and uh, and benevolently extends freedom to the slaves. So one of the issues she explores is what uh, what was Lincoln's thought on a post-slavery society? What would a post-slavery United States look like? And the best evidence that we have, including evidence that I've worked on as a historian directly, is that Lincoln had a, a, a very conflicted viewpoint. Uh, he is absolutely in favor of ending slavery. He absolutely sees it as a moral cause, and he acts like that in very bold ways that I think we should be forever thankful for. Yet at the same time, he's fearful that a post-slavery United States, a multiracial United States, will descend into political violence. And part of that fear leads him to start entertaining ideas such as, do we uh, attempt to relocate the free, freed slaves abroad? Uh, this is the old idea of send them back to Africa, send right. them to Liberia. And during the Civil War, Lincoln adapts this idea. He says, well, maybe we can acquire property in the Caribbean and South America and use that as a, a locale to set all the freed slaves on. Uh, so Nicole Hannah Jones pays attention to this. She brings uh, uh, this into greater notice than many historians have been willing to do because the standard approach to treating colonization, it's, it's, it's often seen as like this, this footnote, this aberration in Lincoln's legacy that he may be toyed around with, but ultimately moved beyond and abandoned, and therefore we can't really uh, judge him or evaluate him against it. She says, no, wait a minute. This is a complexity that shows this isn't like the great white savior stepping right. in. This is actually a practical politician who is wrestling with some ideas, and it actually took him in, in directions that uh, today we would consider morally fraught even though he does uh, um, uh, generally good on the whole in freeing slaves, right. uh, he's very conflicted on that. You know what? Uh, uh, you know part of, part of your critique is that um, it it's not that they're trying this that the, you know that the Times is doing the sixteen nineteen project, but that they toggle back and forth between trying to be serious scholars, yeah. and they have you know half a dozen. You know, uh, historians, uh, none none of the period that we're talking about right. from, uh, from the colonial period through the Civil War, but they have, you know, real advisors going on and people sure. contributing to this. Uh, but so on the, on the one hand, they're 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 making serious or they're attempting to do serious work in a popular venue. And then on the other hand, it's just kind of the worst sort of uh, presentist advocacy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and it's like, this is what I believe now. And so I'm going to rummage through the past and create a genealogy that uh, completely authorizes everything that I believe in. And I create a hero, uh, you know, I create a pantheon of heroes and I create, you know, a cast of villains. Um, 
what you know talk a little bit about that and about your interactions both with Hannah Jones as well as the editor of the Times magazine sure, sure. how does that make you feel like i mean are they are they on the up and up or are they kind of fair weather scholars yeah i, I think they have enlisted scholarship um very inconsistently across the project and you'll notice that uh, you know this is a, a a massive undertaking. It's a magazine with like twenty twenty five different articles in here from all sorts of different article authors, and, and it's only a small handful of them that have received this backlash, received this criticism. Uh, the other works in there are probably best categorized as popular representations of the author's scholarly work. It's a distillation for the New York Times readership of things that would appear in an academic journal article or a book. And that has not been criticized because it's 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 probably pretty high quality representations of what those authors were arguing. But you've got uh, these three or four pieces, the Matthew Desmond one, there's Nicole Hannah Jones's uh, lead essay, and then one or two others that have really blended the lines between scholarship and advocacy. And this is where you start seeing uh claims that capitalism emerged from slavery, and we see this today in the criticism of Obamacare. Right. Uh, or we see this today in the fact that uh, Republicans are resistant to raising taxes for redistribution purposes. Uh, so it's a very presentist agenda that's projected onto uh, historical scholarship. And I think very uh, unfortunately to the project, uh, the Times has dug in its heels behind these political and ideological insertions into the historical narrative, and that's dragged down some of the quality of the other work in there. So my own interactions with Nicole Hannah-Jones, right after this was published, I, I was one of the first uh, scholars to engage the 1619 Project, particularly critiquing Matthew Desmond's piece. And that included both some Twitter back and forth with Nicole Hannah-Jones and a, uh, a few um, edit, uh, letters that I wrote to the editor of the, uh, the, the Times Magazine pointing out factual mistakes in Matthew Desmond's piece. And in both cases, I found uh, not only a willingness to adhere to kind of this ideological line, but there was almost like an incorrigibility to even budge in the slightest in recognizing that, uh, you know, they had overstepped scholarly boundaries and moved into this advocacy politics in ways that really wasn't supported by the evidence. So, um, for example, I asked the Times editor to correct a few claims in the, in the Matthew Desmond piece which I spell out in the book, uh, spell out as, a, as an essay of why it should be retracted. And the response was, was kind of to brush it aside. It was to uh, come up with excuses for why, a, a, I would say, a, a very clear misrepresentation of evidence that he engaged in uh, was nonetheless permissible because it fit with the broader narrative, which they considered to be true. Hmm. Um, at the same time, in Nicole Hannah-Jones's case, uh, you know, she very heavily relied on this new history of capitalism school. The thing I pointed out to, to her right off the bat when this was published was just how contentious this school of thought was among other historians and among other economic historians who have blasted it, who have been very devastating in some of their critiques. And she evinced absolutely no awareness that there was even this dialogue going on within the academic literature. Right. Uh, which shows up, I, I think I counted it up, there were seven different scholars that are cited in this one article on the history of capitalism and slavery, and all seven of them are um, connected to the new history of capitalism school, no one else from outside of that school. So you're, you're basically cutting off the scholarly conversation, and she seemed entirely unconcerned by that. Uh, you know, let's talk a little bit about Lincoln and libertarians. Yeah. Um, you know, your your take on Lincoln is is very nuanced. Um, Lincoln looms large among many uh, kind of, you know, actual economists or historians of a libertarian bent as a particularly terrible leader. Right. He, you know, he's the American Caesar. I mean, it's a, it's a kind of retread right. of Edmund Wilson's uh, old, uh, you know, attacks on, on Lincoln from a left wing perspective in the 30s and yeah. 40s. Um, why is Lincoln singled out among libertarian historians or, you know, and, and, and then, you know, people at the, you know, uh, you know, at Lou Rockwell.com, sure, sure. you know, the Von Mises Institute, Ron Paul never has a good word to say about Lincoln. What's going on there? Yeah. My own take on Lincoln is very nuanced. I, I, I rate him kind of in the middle of the pack of the presidents. There's some very good things he did, obviously connected to um, emancipating the slaves. Uh, I, I think his government, the governmental style, his approach during the war, 
involve some instances of mismanagement. You know, we always hear about the, the suspension of habeas corpus right. is something that really rubs libertarians the wrong way. And I think there are valid criticisms of Lincoln in that sphere. Uh, what I think uh, that literature does uh, that goes kind of off the rails in some cases or really overstates its case in, um, in some of the instances is they tend to project backwards onto Lincoln the effects of the evolution of the American state in the uh, 150 odd years since his presidency. Right. Uh, so there, there, there are, are very genuine concerns that we see in the tw- 20th century about the erosion of federalism and the emergence of a, um, a, a very top down regulatory state on the federal level. A lot of this comes from Woodrow Wilson and FDR in particular. But uh, the claim is made that they're building on the blocks that Lincoln uh, provided them uh, through the course of the Civil War. So it's almost like a presentist projection backwards right. for the libertarian sphere as well. We're, we're unhappy with the legacy of FDR. And uh, one of the inclinations is to look back in history and say, where did this start? Well, um, there's certainly political rhetoric on, on, on the progressive left that tries to claim Lincoln as one of sure. their own. But everybody claimed Lincoln. Right? Exactly. I mean, uh, you know, exactly. Everybody claimed Washington and Lincoln. And, you know, what is the the racial dimension there or the slavery dimension? Because, uh, you know, one of one of the odd things is that when people start to talk about Lincoln uh, and many of the same people who are arch critics among libertarians will also say that the Civil War was not fought in any way, shape or form over slavery and that it was it was really about taxes or about yeah, trade yeah. policy. And and that in order to believe that you have to deny all of the evidence of the yep. fact that southern states, southern states seceded from the Union, and all of them in their documents said, we are doing this because of slavery, not because right. of taxes or tariffs. Right. Um, you know, what, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, and it's not just seceding because of slavery. It's seceding because they viewed the election of Lincoln – as an existential threat right. to public federal subsidies to hold yeah. up the institution of slavery. You read yeah. these declarations, they're furious that Lincoln uh, may undermine the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act, which is basically like this big government federal scheme yeah. uh, to throw money into uh, sitting, sending these um, uh, these slave patrols out to round up uh, escaped fugitives. Well, I mean, and, you, and then, I mean, obviously, uh, perhaps most famously in the cornerstone speech by Alexander Stevens, the vice yeah. president of the Confederacy, he says, you know, the it, you know, slavery isn't incidental to the South. Right. It, it is the central. very cornerstone and like, you know, a, a racial hierarchy in which white, you know, smart white people are at the top, dumb white people are somewhere in between, and black slaves are at the bottom. That this this is the society, capitalism, uh, industrialism, all sure. of this is a threat to it. Um, what you know, do you have a theory as to what explains that uh, you know, that weird fixation among libertarians? Yeah, again, I think it's a case of presentism, and it it involves almost willfully setting aside evidence, uh, willfully setting aside historical evidence to try to rationalize or make the story fit for the explanation that they want to offer to, uh, to to tell why FDR was successful in implementing the New Deal, to tell why the income tax exists today or why the Federal Reserve exists today. Mm-hmm. So you have this litany of policies in, in, in the present day that, that uh, libertarians, I think, with reason, find objectionable, and they want to find an origin story of tracing it back to the Civil War, and that makes them more willing to set aside uh, – uh, evidence that conflicts with that origin story or try to emphasize, well, well, maybe the Civil War was caused by tariffs. Um, you throw on top of this, and there's some complexity to it, the, the Confederates were very effective propagandists mm-hmm. uh, for their cause. They knew during the American Civil War, in Britain in particular, that a, a, a lot of the abolitionists, a lot of the people like Richard Cobden and John Bright, uh, were sympathetic to free trade. They knew that the abolitionists were sympathetic to these pro-market arguments because they had been arguing them for years. Uh, Cobden is like a, um, a pen pal with Charles Sumner, one of the abolitionist senators, uh, who's famous in that era as the leading voice of anti-slavery in the North. Uh, but the Southerners see this, and they're on a quest for diplomatic recognition or trying to keep Britain either out of the war or even get it to come into the war on their side against the North. So they really play up these explanations that are, are saying this this isn't really about slavery. This is about tariffs or taxation. So we have this historical record of what's essentially pro-Confederate propaganda that was offered to try and, and, and dupe some of the uh, foreign powers into coming into their side during the war. 
And unfortunately, I think a lot of libertarians have seen that and they've taken it at face value and tried to elevate it to uh, their own narrative. You you know, you've also written, uh, you were a vocal and I think particularly effective critic of Nancy McLean and yep. her book, yep. Democracy in Chains, which, um, you know, essentially said that libertarianism and, and things like school choice, the idea of right. school choice is a neo-Confederate plot. Um, and she picks up on a point which... I think people in the libertarian movement were always kind of slow to, which is that, you know, in the 1955 essay that Milton Friedman wrote talking about school vouchers for the first time, he does mention, uh, you know, kind of what was brewing as massive resistance in the South to create essentially a voucher program so that whites could stay in segregated schools in the wake of uh, Brown versus Board of Education. You know, what... what is the effect, do you think, on this kind of linking up of Confederacy, in certain cases, anti-Lincoln rhetoric, yeah. and the modern libertarian movement? Uh, when Rand Paul you know, announced to, that he was going to run uh, for president, uh, which he bizarrely right. <laughs> did on the Rachel Maddow show, he immediately – you know, got embroiled in a conversation about how, you know, the Civil Rights Act was, be- you know, the real problem with it was, you know, that it meant that you couldn't have segregated lunch counters anymore or something like that. Right, There's right. something, I, I don't know any libertarians, uh, you know, who are racist or are, you know, apologists for a, seg- you know, a state segregated society, but it keeps coming up. What, you know, can you talk a little bit about this and how do we clarify what's going on in a way that allows libertarians to stop having to explain things that aren't actually part of their legacy? Yeah, I worry that quite a bit of this comes out of just a natural contrarianism, mm-hmm. uh, contrarianism against uh, what's the official history or the, right. uh, the, the the standard dialogue. And quite a bit of that takes the form of trying to be too clever by half. It takes the form of, uh, oh, I'm going to offer an edgy take that uh, may sound like it chafes with uh, conventional wisdom, but it also ends up being a tone deafness to uh, some very real struggles. Uh, You know, my counter to that is, and I'd urge any and every libertarian listener, reader out there to, uh, is to investigate your own history, investigate the history of where classical liberalism came from, rediscover people like Richard Cobden, or, uh, or even go back to some better known names like, uh, uh, Frederick Bastiat, go back to the lesser known works of Adam Smith. You find explicit abolitionism running throughout all of these works. Uh, that is a classical liberal cause, possibly the preeminent cause of classical liberals in the 19th century before the Civil War is ending slavery. And we've kind of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say jettisoned it, we've just set it aside and forgotten that legacy is also part of uh, of our our system of ideas too. There is, you know, I guess there's a sociological uh, dimension to this um, in that, you know, Barry Goldwater, for many people, and I, I know, uh, you know, older libertarians will talk about kind of being activated into politics in the 60s by Ayn Rand and, and Barry Goldwater. And Barry Goldwater, who by everyone's account, even his critical biographers will say, you know, this was not a guy who was a racist or anything. But there's no question in 1964, he rolled that way. Um, and he, you know, that that creates a kind of toxic junction, I think, Um that hasn't been fully uh, kind of excavated and worked through, I suspect, by libertarians. Yeah. yeah, I think, unfortunately, what we saw in the Goldwater movement is, uh, you know, you have a um, – he's a very intellectual candidate. Uh, he's a guy that thinks mm-hmm. about ideas very seriously. He surrounds himself with advisors that are, uh, you know, what we consider well-known libertarian figures today. It's Carl Hess. It's, uh, yeah. it's uh, Warren Nutter. It's, um, uh, you know, just very prominent thinkers, intellectuals. But um, – Part of the struggle that comes out of the Goldwater movement is, uh, you know, if you're running for political office, you want to win. And I think, unfortunately, he tapped into a current of votes that happened to be the Deep South. Right. It happened to be the, the the Gulf Coast states that are involved in this either massive resistance against desegregation or that gravitate to him not because of the intellectual message he's put forth, but because they, they see him as a vehicle to uh, fighting back against the Civil Rights Act. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, about, you know, kind of un- uncovering or, or reading your own history and developing your own history. Um, talk a little bit about the benefits of the 1619 Project, which is, you know, I, we 
It, it's interesting. I, I have two sons who are uh, one's 26, the other's 18. And all they have been taught is a kind of revisionist history, yeah. which has now the new kind of conventional history. I was taught something going to school in the 70s and 80s. I was taught a it was different than the history my parents who went to school in the 30s right. learned. Um, you know, so it's always changing. But what is one of the benefits of saying, you know what, America didn't begin in 1776 or 1789 or whatever. It, it begins in 1619. You know, what is, what's a positive uh, outcome of that? Well, I think if it directs more readers to start to investigate the nuances and complexities of the history of slavery, mm -hmm. I think there's a there's been a tendency for as long as we have been teaching history in schools to approach slavery in a very superficial level. And this is whether it's the current narrative, which does focus on slavery, but focuses on it as a, um, a, a very simplified version of the topic. Mm -hmm. Slavery was evil, uh, which we, I think, pretty much yeah. everyone acknowledges, but, but it doesn't go deeper than that surface to figure out what's actually going on. Right. Uh, whereas if you went back a few generations, there's kind of this lost cause projection onto slavery, especially in the southern states, that tried to sugarcoat it or gloss right. over it or minimize it. Uh, so it's, a, again, a very superficial type of an argument, even though it's in the complete different direction. Uh, I, I do think that there's some benefits uh, of something like the 1619 Project, or at least uh, in its idealized version, what it set out yeah. to do is say, uh, let's poke a little bit deeper. Let's get into uh, uh, some of the complexities, uh, especially like the American Revolution. Um, you, you know, my, my counter to something like Nicole Hannah Jones, who who offers this uh, this version that places slavery at the center of the American Revolution, I would argue we need to study the American Revolution as a uh, an engagement with slavery that cuts across both sides of the war. Mm -hmm. There are pro-slavery and anti-slavery figures on the patriots or colonist side. There are pro-slavery and anti-slavery figures on the loyalist side uh, and the British side uh, during the war. Uh, so it's not like this black and white right. dimension. Rather, it, it's something that is, is playing out uh, uh, in a way that cuts across both sides of the war at a time when uh, the question of independence is being fought and hammered out. Uh, right. So there's, and, there's and not a clean just, history. And on the on the eve of uh, kind of rise of a, of the industrial revolution, mm -hmm. and what we would I think tend to see as a more contemporary or a modern version of free labor, of the idea that a, that a worker could choose among competing uh, employers, that employers would have to actually you know uh, strike fair bargains or or be held to bargains with workers and things like that. Um, yeah. It uh, you know for me one of the I what I found. Interesting about the 1619 Project, as it was announced, uh, was also that I, I started thinking about my version of American history. And I want to ask you about yours of, of like, you know, we bring personal stories to this. And in many ways, my grandparents who came over in the 19 teens were all immigrants from Ireland and Italy. And in a lot of ways, my American history really starts in the 19 teens, um, sure. you know, or at least with any kind of personal connection to it. Um, if you're an African-American, if you're black, it does start with 1619. And it is a grim history. And again and again, the contributions, the, the, the you know, uh, much of American culture and society and wealth has been built on the, the backs of blacks. Uh, and it wasn't acknowledged properly. Um, so it's interesting for me, it started me thinking about, okay, how do I conceive of America? And how is my America different than somebody else's. Could you talk a little bit about your, uh, you know, how your personal history, your family history yeah. um, kind of influences your interest in various topics and also your intellectual journey? How do you, uh, you, you have a PhD um, in, it, it's in public policy, right. is that right? right. Yeah, from George Mason. Uh, and George Mason, you know, uh, is named for one of the most bizarre and interesting and kind of complicated contradictory founders. Yeah. Um, but, you know, talk a little bit about Phil Magnus, where you come from and how that informs your intellectual journey and, and your areas of interest. Yeah, you know, it's, my family is probably a lot like your family story. Uh, my mother is an immigrant from Canada. Uh, her parents uh, came from England and Ireland. Uh, mm -hmm. So first generation and then another first generation. Yeah. Uh, my dad's family, half of it came from Mexico at the turn of the century. The other half of it has been here since the 1600s. Mm -hmm. So I've got a little bit of a stake in almost uh, every type of yeah. story imaginable. Um, I, I can't claim to be, you know, um, um, uh, 
someone that's that's latched on to this one specific version of American history that starts in 1776. Uh, that's just not my family story. Yeah. Um, it, it, but at the same time, I'd say my my approach to uh, to history diverges from quite a bit of the profession and quite a bit of the popular narratives in the sense that I I don't tend to see history as like this predetermined evolving story where, uh, where there's an end game of where we know where we're going. Rather, it's a, it's a succession of events that are unfolding in almost unpredictable ways uh, based on the circumstance of the moment. Uh, this is where I, th- I think we start to see um, inputs of something like public choice theory really weighing into our understanding of the past. It's not a, a, a grand unifying theory of the, uh, uh, of the universe or of, of the way that uh, historical events play out. Rather, it's a, a, a system of tools to understand and interpret and, um, and work our way through evidence to figure out what's going on, often under the cloud of uncertainty. So Abraham Lincoln's a classic example. When he ascends to the presidency in 1861, when he's inaugurated, uh, he, he probably has no idea that just in the course of two to three years, he was going to be emancipating the slaves. Right. He's going to be signing the Emancipation Proclamation. It's rather the course of events that unfolded before him that make that possible. Uh, so there's not like this this grand arc of history that's driving toward this inevitability. Rather, it's a person reacting to the uncertainties and circumstances of the moment. You know, you you mentioned public choice, which brings us back to James Buchanan, which you know brings us to among other things the Nancy McLean art you know argument against uh, you know that Buchanan was actually an agent of white supremacy. <laughs> Uh, which I think is untenable and has yeah. been shown uh, to be so. Whether whether or not that affects whether you know if her interpretation wins out or not is is a totally separate question. But it seems to me that one of the problems with uh, a Buchanan kind of view or a public choice view is you know it's economics without sure. romance, it's history sure. <laughs> without romance, it's everything without romance, and. In that sense, it's a very corrosive way of looking at history because you can't have kind of those grand narratives or idealism goes out the window. Do you think that that's part of the reason why certain elements of kind of libertarian thought, um, you know, they may end up forming a very powerful critique? And certainly, I uh, you know, I, I read uh, Public Choice, my backgrounds in literary studies, and I was reading Foucault. Um, and, you know, the way Foucault talks about how power operates and the way that Buchanan and uh, Gordon Tullock and other public sure. choice theorists do, it is almost identical, sure. which is that we tell these stories, uh, and, you know, and they can be stories about, oh, you know, here's a great, wonderful entrepreneur who just wants to help people, uh, or here is a great public servant who just wants to help people. Here are doctors. Here's a medical industry that just wants to help people. No, you know, both Foucault and the public choice people seem to say, we have to look deeper and we have to look at what's actually going on. What are the motivations and what are the effects on people? Do you think that that's one of you know it it just makes it harder for a libertarian narrative or, or a libertarian rhetoric to really become you know mainstream because yeah. it it's you know it it's it's a pretty punishing ideology in that sense yeah i think in a way we're all arguing against the legacy of someone like thomas carlyle who <laughs> We know his history, uh, which is his great contribution to historical study and understanding is he, he posits the great man theory of history, mm-hmm. that there are, uh, are vibrant leaders that emerge over time. And this could be a Napoleon Bonaparte. It could be an Oliver right. Cromwell. Um, and, you know, Carlyle has his own people that he does latch on to, right. and they tend to be some pretty ugly, pretty awful tyrants of history. But there are adaptations that could go in any direction. This is why we like to tell great stories about George Washington or Abraham Lincoln or FDR. Uh, we like to have uh, history that's built around presidents that we can prop up as heroic or uh, on the other side is defined as villains. So it's a, it's a very Manichaean approach that tends to infiltrate just the basic conception of history in the public's mind. And I think we're, we're almost at a disadvantage of having to go against that because people like to root for a leader or they like to root for a good guy or at least root against a bad guy. And, you know, as libertarians, as classical liberals, or, or I'd say even more so as good evidence-based empirical thinkers – uh, the necessity of our approach is going to add complexity. It's going to add nuance. It's going to add ways that are not easily summarized in a grand narrative story. 
And that makes it automatically hard, harder for us to carry that type of a message. It also makes us more susceptible uh, to criticism in the fact that we're not offering an alternative to the great man that's favored by someone else, whether that's on the left or the right. Yeah, and, and if we're being intellectually honest and serious, we're also not offering a version of Whig history right. <laughs> or anything where, well, you know, this is the best of all possible worlds, and we're just going to tell you a just-so story of how we got to exactly this place in time where everything is perfect. Yeah. Um, you know, one of your, your previous book uh, before the 1619 uh, uh, Project Critique uh, is Cracks in the Ivory Tower. You yeah. co-wrote it with uh, Jason Brennan of Georgetown. Uh, this is, I think, very early in the book, and I, I believe I'm quoting accurately here. You, you, you guys say, you know, this is a book about academics or yeah. academia without romance. It's, it's right. a fine, fine choice. <laughs> what is, what's the main theory of Cracks in the Ivory Tower, and why is it important? Yeah, so, so our main argument is that institutions matter. And if you throw just normal people into an academic situation, they're going to respond to the institutional structures and the incentives that those create. Uh, so what that means for higher education is we have a very uh, well-funded, vast system. It's a it's basically a trillion-dollar enterprise unto itself. Uh, if, you, if you start looking at things like student loans that are out there and the amount of money that goes into it, uh, it employs millions of people and, uh, and affects millions of students. Uh, but the incentive structures of higher ed are often misaligned from the purposes that we say we have the university system. So you ask a, uh, a typical college administrator or professor, why are you doing what you're doing? It's always this public minded, uh, high level where we're creating an educated society or we're molding better citizens or, uh, we're empowering people to, uh, uh, to tackle the world and improve themselves. So, uh, very lofty, high minded rhetoric and goals that, uh, I think we'd all aspire to. But then you juxtapose that to what higher ed actually delivers and you see it falls short on most of these promises and often far short of, um, of, of some of the more extreme promises. Uh, so we basically ask the question of, um, of, of what's going on in the university system. Because uh, we, we, we know we hear all the time that there are problems. There are budget right. shortfalls or tuition skyrocketing. Yeah, uh, kids are burdened with debt. There's too many students. There's not enough students. Exactly. I, they, I mean, if you study the history of the university, yeah, uh, you know, just in the 20th and 21st century, it's, it's just the history of lurching from crisis to crisis. Exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, so the, the, the standard approach that if you read the Chronicle of Higher Education, they they follow these grand uh, narratives that are built around what we call poltergeists in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, universities are in financial crisis right now because they're being corporatized. Mm -hmm. Universities uh, have a student loan crisis because neoliberalism moved in. And what's a poltergeist? It's this evil, malicious entity that tears up the room and makes a giant mess in its wake. But poltergeists are also not real. They're spiritual entities. So it's kind of like this uh, um, academia tends to latch on to concepts as scapegoats for all of its problems. But if you dig beneath the surface, you find a much more mundane explanation of misaligned incentives and people just acting like rational human actors. Right. Uh, people but, pursuing like, their own self-interest. Yeah, if you if you reward people for acting poorly, you shouldn't be surprised when they when they act do poorly. You <laughs> right. Know. Uh, you know, one thing I wanted to ask you um, is, you know, you're an academic. You have a PhD. Um, you are, but uh, you are not an academic, yes. right? Or you're not in academia. Um, I read a lot, and a lot of my friends that I went to grad school with, uh, you know, some of them went on to be tenure track or tenured professors. Others faded out of the industry altogether. Others were adjuncts. Um, you know, why Why did you choose not to become a, 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 a full-time professor? Uh, yeah. And is that is that a cause for tragedy? I mean, like you, and I, I feel, um, because I spent a lot of time earning it, I feel compelled to sure, always sure. bring up the fact I have a PhD whenever I can. I chose not to go into academia. My ex-wife is a, is a full professor at uh, Chapman University at, mm -hmm. as we speak. Um, a lot of my friends from grad school are, you know, in academia, not in academia. I chose not to. I'm kind of happy with it. I, I feel like I learned a lot in it. Why didn't you become an academic? And is that a failing of the university system as it currently exists? Or is it a choice on your part? Or is it something altogether different? No. I, 
I would categorize it on my own sense as a personal choice. So I spent uh, the better part of a decade uh, one way or another yeah. working in academia. Uh, I, I taught college, uh, taught economics full time for a while. Um, I, I held various administrative posts, adjuncted, taught part time, uh, did all of that game. And I think it was very fulfilling at the time. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed being in the classroom. Uh, but I also found that the way that, uh, you know, academic hiring is structured, the way that, that um, uh, promotions are rewarded, uh, someone who does the type of research that I tend to do, uh, which I've, I think I've been fairly successful at, at getting published, at getting uh, uh, meaningful uh, contributions to a, a wide variety of literature out there in print, uh, but the type of research that I tend, I tend to do is not something that is prioritized uh, for a whole number of reasons, uh, especially at what we would call elite research universities. Uh, so it came down to a, a decision whether I teach like a 4-4 course load, uh, which can be very fulfilling in its own right, uh, versus having time to do uh, more high-end research. Mm-hmm. So um, I did the former for a little while and uh, and then migrated into the latter to where uh, – so my current position is uh, is basically 100 percent devoted to uh, researching the topics that I'm interested in, uh, doing that with a, an independent research institution. Yeah. So we're very fortunate in that regard. But um, I, I have found that fulfilling uh, even though I do miss some elements of the classroom. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's – I think, you know, the and, and I know that in Cracks in the Ivory Tower, you point out that um, it is a vast oversimplification to say that the tenure track model is disappearing from the university right. Uh, right. or from all universities. It is not. And it is also true that that if you can get a tenured position somewhere, it is an incredibly uh, sweet gig, not sure. because not not because you don't do work, but because you have so much autonomy and time to do you know, the type of work and research that, you know, that people would love to be able to do if you're intellectually minded that way. Do you feel that um, the university system is in a particular era of transition now? And again, I'm, you know, I mentioned before, if you go back and you look at, you know, pre-World War II, post-World War II, post about 1970, when women, uh, you know, by the early 80s, uh, women, there were more women, uh, uh, attending undergrad institutions than men, uh, that had a change. Uh, the levels of state funding, the you know the the desire, kind of the social desire to have more educated people. We've constantly been going through you know paroxysms of uh, of change, transition, et cetera. Do you think the university is in a particular uh, you know particularly strong moment of change? Um, and if so. How does, because, you know, as uh, if I'm going to mention that I have a PhD, I think I also feel that I need to say we're talking, you know, remotely because of the coronavirus sure. and the lockdown and the right. quarantine, which, among other things, has shut down every college in the country. Uh, yeah. You know, now, how is that going to change higher education? But uh, so to simplify, um, are, is the university in a particular moment of change now? That's one question. And then how do you think the coronavirus changes higher ed? Or maybe it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. So prior to the coronavirus, I would have said uh, uh, that universities are continuing to evolve on more of a path trajectory than a disruptive trajectory. Okay. Uh, So I I can't predict exactly how long this is going to last and what moving everything online is going to do. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I will say, and I think this is uh, true of university evolution from about the post-World War II period to a couple months ago, is that uh, there's a heavy public expenditure component that came into its own in the 50s, 60s, and 70s and has been with us. What that means from an economic perspective is that universities are basically in the in the business of rent seeking and rent allocation uh, from the public sector. And what do we know about uh, rent seeking? What do we know about um, vast government programs of a, of a similar magnitude uh, when they become entrenched? Is they're very very hard to disrupt or change course or dissipate or abolish or whatever you want to do with it. I mean, it's like trying to, uh, to steer the Titanic with a rubber band. That's the, right. uh, uh, the, the situation so that I consider this is kind of university, the university as medic, the university as Medicare, where, 
you know, there might be some nibbling exactly. around the edges, but by and large, we're still going to be spending a lot of money on it and it's going to affect a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. that and you said, that is your, your thinking until a couple months ago. Um, how does right. the, how right. does the coronavirus change that? And you talk about a, a weird random event that nobody saw coming, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, and we'll put aside the idea that there were five or six people in the federal government who could have stopped this. But, you know, the coronavirus comes in, this is a black swan or something that really is disruptive. How does that change your understanding of where universities were headed? Yeah, well, I think prior to uh, just a few months ago, the main area of what we would call, for lack of a better term, budgetary bloat in the university system was all these administrative roles that are just expanding like crazy. Uh, and we see this empirically from the 1970s to the present day. Administration has more than quadrupled in right. size. I think you have uh, even a though- stat in uh, Cracks in the Ivory Tower or something that like 20, 30 or 40 years ago, I think it was that there were four administrators for every 10 professors, right. uh, tenure track professors. And now it's that there are nine professors for every 10 administrators or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like the administrators yeah. have, have far surpassed professors yeah. itself on campus. Right. Uh, even though universities are basically delivering the same type of good, they're delivering a degree. Yeah. So I think prior to just a few months ago, a lot of that was taking place on um, on university campuses through rent seeking, through rent allocation, off of budgets that are built around having a very large student body on campus. So administrators grew in conjunction with universities providing more what they call student services. Right. But student services are often little pet projects. Mm -hmm. um, that was a lot easier to justify when classes were held in person and when the student body is there living in the dorm. You start to move things online, uh, you, you can ask the question, mm -hmm. what does the director of sustainability, climate change, and parking lots have to do anymore? Right. Uh, so I think the longer that this type of a crisis persists, uh, that kind of pulls back the cover on the question of whether some of these roles are necessary or whether some of these new developments of what uh, had grown on campus is um, in, is essential to the business that we're doing. I think the second thing that, uh, that COVID has done is it started to expose some of the uh, financial pressures that higher ed places on students themselves through rising tuition. It's starting to get people to ask the question, well, I'm paying full tuition, but now I'm taking kind of like this shell of a class that's now online. Should I have to pay the same tuition rate as I would if I got the in-person experience? And I think a lot of people are going to start asking questions and saying, no, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe there should be other discounts. So uh, do you think, I mean, do you envision a kind of hybrid model that is somewhere between, you know, a more traditional residential college, which it's it's not clear what percentage of, you know, undergrads actually went to a four-year residential college, right. uh, you know, and, and lived apart from their parents as opposed to, you know, living near the campus with their family in an urban area or whatever. Um, but uh, do you think it's more likely that we'll see a, you know, a kind of a hybrid model where some or, or at a particular school, a lot of maybe more introductory classes will be delivered via Zoom or via lecture with a couple of right. recitation sections or higher level classes will be all in person, but lower, you know, et cetera. How do you see this playing out? I think that there is going to be a bit of a trend to diversifying how what we would call gen eds are delivered. Mm -hmm. So your history 101, math 101, English right. 101, uh, standard classes everyone has to take. Uh, under the pre-COVID model, and I guess the standard model from history is you, you show up freshman year and the first two years are, are spent knocking out your gen eds, right. and then you move into your major. Um I think this does open up a bit of an opportunity, especially if someone wants to be entrepreneurial about it, of finding ways to deliver gen eds that don't require the butts and seats model of sitting there in the classroom. Although uh, whether you, that's you and Jason Brennan are pretty, uh, I mean, you you are pretty big believers in the signaling model of higher yeah. education, and so that yeah. what matters it's less that you know it's less what you learn as an undergrad, and it's more where you have a degree from. So right. you yeah. still want that piece of paper from a particular school rather than you know uh, you know uh, online MOOC university, right? Right. Uh, you want it to say. 
you know, Dartmouth or I don't know, wherever. Sure, um, sure. So how, do, how does that factor in? Because, and I, I, you know, and I'm thinking now, I know a lot of people who teach at state universities and around the country, there has been a big push to say that um, any state school in any, uh, you know, in any state has to accept community college courses, Credits, uh, yeah. you know, for full credit. And that there was a push to try and get people to take their gen ed classes at community college, and then you show up at the, the residential school where you're going to graduate from, and that way you spend less money, and you but you get the full freight or you get the full impact of a degree from a name university. Um, right, right. You know, how does that intersect with uh, you know with what we've been talking about here? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the end goal of most students when they graduate, they want the piece of paper that says Harvard or Princeton right. if they're going to an elite school, or maybe they want uh, University of Texas at Austin, University of Virginia, um, like a major flagship state university. Right. If it can be the case that uh, that you can transfer in community college credits for your writing 101 and math 101 course, uh, which basically the content is more or less the same, right. uh, you aren't getting much of a premium by doing that at the uh, the, the, the full four year institution you you uh, graduate from, but you can save quite a bit on cost. Uh, that is one way to alleviate uh, one of the driving concerns right now of higher education, which is tuition skyrocketing. Right. Uh, I think prior to COVID, uh, there still seemed uh, to be something of a premium of the, the college experience of spending all four years at the one place. Yeah. Uh, I, I do think that some of the move online will make people a little bit more willing to venture out beyond that model. Uh, make the average students to start to think, hey, if I can knock out this course online at my community college and transfer it into UVA or uh, University of Michigan next semester, and then I declare my major, I've got my gen eds out of the way, I've done it at like uh, half the cost or a fifth of the cost even in some of these cases, and they're taking the credits, yeah. but then I go do my upper division classes at that institution, I graduate with the same degree, the same certificate that someone who spent all four years there did. All right. Well, you know what? Uh, we're going to leave it there. We have been talking with Phil Magnus. He's the author most recently of the 1619 Project, a critique. And before that, with uh, Jason Brennan, he was the co-author of Cracks in the Ivory Tower, which is a pretty fascinating read about the about academia without romance. Uh, Phil, what else? Uh, what else are you working on? It, it seems like you know it's been fifteen or twenty minutes. Right. Uh, you should have another book project in the works. What's What's next for you? Oh, all sorts of things. Um, I say historically, I'm looking more into the role of um, of government institutions and in subsidizing slavery in the 19th century, hmm. uh, which is, uh, I think, a big part of the story that's been underplayed or underrepresented right. well, in the and, emancipation. Uh, you know, I, I, at the risk of going back into a full uh, conversation about the 1619 <laughs> Project and a lot of the historiography of slavery, uh, both that it it you know, it it kind of uh, leans on, but also then ignores. The, you know, what is fascinating is when you and you were you were talking about this before. When you start to think about slavery as a complex social, cultural, political, economic system, you know, and and you you understand like how could it persist? I mean, I, you know, and this is where the the kind of simplified versions that we get often, you know, whether it's in history classes or in movies you know, just don't really do it justice. Whereas movies like Absolutely. 12 Years a Slave, and I, I am particularly, even though it's very much a movie about movies, not about history, Django Unchained, like the focus on the physical torment that was visited, you know, that was visited upon slaves was like a missing part of how slavery operated. Uh, but you're talking about how government in various ways and at various levels actually subsidized or created, because there's no question that when the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, and it started saying to people, you know, abolitionists, no, you have to help us hunt down free, so, you know, escape slaves. Exactly. You know, that's exactly. a major subsidy, and that, that also causes more and more problems. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'd say even it's a project that builds on the legacy of Adam Smith, or, you know, as Deirdre McCloskey says, St. Adam Smith. Right. Uh, you know, he, here's a thinker 
that attacked slavery on moral grounds uh, through moral sentiments and objections to uh, the horrors of the institution. Here's someone that also critiques the economics of the slavery, and then least discussed of the elements he goes after, the political economy of the slavery, the role of state institutions in propping this up. So he has an observation. He says that the uh, the British colonies where slavery is the worst, the slave owners themselves have somehow managed to get themselves elected to the colonial assembly. Hmm. And they're never going to abolish or reform or do anything that works against the, the institution itself, uh, so long as that persists. Uh, so that element is there in, in this Smithian project. I see myself as, is, um, updating that, uh, with 200 years of history and records to build upon, but also just seeing how that plays out to add greater depth to the dimension of this project, uh, and, and this topic that's often just glossed over in the, in the standard textbook histories. Well, that's a, uh, it sounds fantastic, and we'll all be looking forward to reading it. Phil Magnus, thanks for talking to Reason. Yeah, thanks for having me.